Here. It will, you'll hear me in a minute oh. while I'm talking until it gets quiet. <laughs> there we go. So I'd like to introduce our speaker. It's David George Brook. Uh, he's known as that gratitude guy. Uh, he's been a speaker, a teacher, life coach, and best-selling author for over 30 years. He's a former North Sea store manager. He means what I understand why he looks so sharp. And has managed the corporate world for over 35 years. His published books include the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, Happiness Starts with Gratitude, and Gratitude Nuggets to Chew On. I like that. He's featured, he was featured on New Day with Margaret Larson on King TV, and recently shared the stage with Bill Gates Sr. at a regional conference. With over 450 gratitude videos posted on YouTube, Thousands have seen his message, and he is now considered a leading authority on gratitude and how a how living a life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life. Please welcome David George Burke. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Randy. I know we are still uh, eating our lunch, so uh, I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I do a few little exercises. So you may be eating your uh, meal in just a couple of different chunks here, if you don't mind, but. Um, let me start out by saying, well, first of all, I want to thank Jamie Taylor and Randy Spitzer for inviting me. I was mentioning to Eleanor and Alan and Warren and a couple of other people I met today about how I'm blessed enough to do this two or three times a week, and I feel very, very fortunate. So let me just jump right in and start out with a show of hands. How many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? Oh my goodness, that's 90%. Thank you. So I, as I mentioned, get to do this two or three times a week. I do high school commencements where the average age is about 18. I do nursing homes where the average age is about mid-90s. And it goes anywhere from half the kids that are 18 raise their hands to about 95, 100% in the nursing homes, as you can imagine. So I'd like to tell you real briefly about my personal significant loss. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked to my side to see where my wife Dana was and she wasn't there. Oh, that's awfully strange. And so just as I'm getting out of bed to look for Dana, my four-year-old Connor comes over and goes, where's mom? I, went, I don't know. Let's see if we can find her. So we walk down the hallway and my, so my son, my older son, Kyle's 14, same question. We don't know where she is. So we look in a couple of rooms and we walk down the hallway and we look downstairs and here's Dana down in front of the washer and dryer and she's all crumpled over, all hunched over and something's not right. So we run down there and I turn her over and there's Stuff coming out of her mouth and it didn't look good. Connor starts crying. What's wrong with mommy? And Kyle, I said, Kyle, go call the cops and the fire and the police. And within a matter of about five or ten minutes, there must have been 25 people in our house. And they had taken Dana and they put her out on the rec room in the basement and they had the tubes and those electronic paddles and they were giving her that shock thing. And Again, I think I was mentioning this to Eleanor, I always am fortunate enough to chat with people because I have my books and journals in the back at the end that tell me these stories that are just unbelievable that we've gone through. And some people aren't going to raise their hand and tell it in front of a group, but they certainly will to me one-on-one. -on -one. Well, for anybody that's ever been through something that traumatic, I will tell you one thing that happens is time loses all measure. And this little short fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for 45 minutes. Check that, make that an hour, she says. We still don't have a heartbeat. He wants to continue. And even when you're in shock, this CPU up here, this brain we have, still manages to work a little bit. And I thought, wow, one hour without a heartbeat. And I went, no, you can stop. And she was dead. She was 38 years old. And as I mentioned, Connor was four and Kyle was 14. And I remember thinking at some point, because the way that time had been, when you're in shock, it was two or three days later that I didn't even know if I was having the worst nightmare I'd ever had or this was something that was actually happening. And I walked up this little deck. We lived by Green Lake in Seattle. And I just pinched myself and went, wow, this is real. I'm just a little guy with skin and bones and just trying to get through life. And I thought, I just sat there, I was by myself because our house had had friends and family just swarming all over us for two or three days, thankfully. But I looked up to the sky and for the first time in my life I realized why people killed themselves. Because I don't think I can do this. And what I haven't said, I'm not going to go into much detail, is this was just 
the end of a long list and actually since then the people had passed away on me. I forget if it was Marlon I was talking to or Tracy, I forget, one of the, maybe it was Eleanor, but it's just ridiculous. All these people had died. And my father was a very prominent attorney and he'd committed suicide. And my mother had died of cancer and a bunch of buddies of mine were killed in Vietnam and at the University of Washington. Car accidents and it just went on and on and with the 25 people that were very close to me that I lost in my life, I'd say half of them were of their own hand. Dana died of a prescription pill overdose and she'd gotten hooked on Vicodin and Oxycontin and all this crap. And I've got friends that fried their livers and their brains and just it just is ridiculous. And again, with a couple of the conversations I've had already, one of the things I talk about with this gratitude, which I'll get into a minute in a minute, is it gives you a healthy coping mechanism in a world of incredibly high amounts of deadly coping mechanisms that just are destructive and kill people all the time. But I realized right then, I sat and thought about that for five minutes and I went, nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm not killing myself. Connor and Kyle had already lost their mother, so what good is it for me to go jump off the Aurora Bridge and leave them with no parents? So once you make a decision, you're not going to do something, it's off the table. It's not an option anymore. But I also realize too that it depends a lot on how you look at something. And every one of us, again I've already had some neat conversations today, Eleanor and I were talking about this. Happiness is a choice. How you look at anything is a choice. I'm not sure you can truly be happy without being grateful. Which is one of the main themes I talk about. But it does depend on how you look at something. So I'd like you to all, I know I apologize in advance, I'd like you to all stand up if you would. I know you're having lunch. And I want you to take your right hand and extend it up. It always feels good to kind of stretch and start turning it in a clockwise manner. Now if you look around the room, there's no clock. so. If anybody needs any help, there's a watch. Because, you know, I go to high schools, they go, what's clockwise? I go, never mind. <laughs> they, they really don't know their digital world. So just keep it going clockwise. Now, just start bringing it down slowly. Keep it going clockwise. Bring it down to the top of your head, your eyes, your chin, your chest, and now down to your waist. Now what direction is it going? Bueller? Okay, thank you. You can sit down. <laughs> thank you, Mike. There's, there's always, thank you, Jamie. There's always a few people doing this. Like, what the heck just happened? Thank you. I don't know your name next to Jamie, but thank you for doing that. It always makes me feel better. It's just another way. I could say the glass is half full or it's half empty, but it's another way. It depends on how you look at it. I was talking to Marlon about going to the University of Washington to have these fraternity brothers. I'm going to see him tomorrow. We get together every month for the last 40 years for breakfast. And they go, you know, we've, I've seen your little presentation. And frankly, we're not that impressed. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> true fraternity brothers. But Gary says to me, that thing, this thing, how does that work? I go, if you're such a genius, you're a PhD, how come you don't know what it is? Well, do they go change midstream? And I go, no, it's not about that at all. It's about how you look at something. So... When Dana had passed away, and I realized I'm going to have to survive to raise these children, I was going to need a, need a method at some point, and I hadn't really truly discovered gratitude like I did now. But as I said, it depends on how you look at something. So now I'm going to apologize for the second time. Grab a 3 by 5 card that is in the center of the table and a pen. There should be plenty of pens around. And if you don't have a pen or a 3 by 5 card, raise your hand and pick a partner. Everybody's got to partner up, so I don't know if there's even numbers at most of the tables. Hopefully there are. And some people are quicker than others. Are any need for pens or cards or anything? Okay. So you got your partner. Here's what I want you to do. There's always some people that are faster than others. Up in the upper left-hand corner of that 3 by 5 card right, I see you as. Those four words. And for those of you that are speedy, no partner? Oh, good. good. To the right-hand side, if I see you as, write your partner's name. To the right-hand side, if I see you as, write your partner's name. And Tracy? Uh, it's A-L-L-E-N. Just, just checking. And then down in the lower right-hand corner, write or sign your name. Okay, so across the top, I see you as, and your partner's name, lower right-hand corner, your name. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you 60 seconds, 
and I want you to write privately, not just consulting, how you see your partner. How you see him, you see any adjectives, happy, friendly, whatever it might be. Go ahead, 60 seconds and write down how you view that person that's your partner. Go. No, con no conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I'm appearing two shows nightly through Friday. <laughs> One word, sentence, whatever you want to put. Just how you see them. Sorry. Okay, okay, settle down. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> However you see him, this isn't a big thing, this isn't rocket science. Okay, ten seconds to go. Wow. I hope he has more than you. <laughs> okay, and stop. Okay, now I know you could write some more, write less, whatever, but here's what I want you to do. Take 60 seconds and tell each other what you wrote about each other. Take turns and tell each other, go. stop so now exchange your cards and give the card to the person that you wrote about so they can uh, keep it so my question is I don't have enough time today I do a lot of workshops where I have a lot more time but I like to go around the room sometimes and read things but when you see what that person wrote about you and you now have that card how many people by show of hands are going to hold on to that card once again about 90% except for Mike and uh, Christine are getting a divorce um, <laughs> <laughs> and the point that I, the reason I like to do this, this can be total strangers, or it can be soon to be ex-husband and ex-wife over here. <laughs> and when you embrace gratitude, when you, ins you get this idea of what you're grateful for, focusing on everything you have versus what you don't have, that's what that card does. And every time I ask somebody to raise their hand, how many people are going to hang on to it? 90% of the people, if not all of them, raise their hand. And when you go around the room and you watch people, and I have smaller groups, and they read what the person wrote about them, it's incredible the looks on the people's faces. Because we tend to be so hard on ourselves and beat ourselves up, but when you embrace gratitude, it's all about focusing on what you have versus what you don't have. Now, I will tell you, I've got a risky situation over here, but when I'm in high schools, I've learned not to do this because they write to their friend in high school, I see you as an idiot. And I go, it's, come on, you guys, they're 18 or they're 17 or whatever, so it doesn't count. But it's something that I just want to make sure people understand. That's why I do that exercise. And the person that you're going to want to get to know best in your entire life is that person you see in the mirror. And that's one of the ways to do it. So my very first thing I like to talk about is that, embracing gratitude. The second thing is it takes as long as it takes. Now, I was having a conversation with Marlon. So as you heard in the intro, I used to work for Nordstrom. I am 64, I'll be 65 in January. It took me 45 years to become a speaker. I wanted to be a speaker when I was 18. And all this other stuff happened. Dana passed away and all these different things happened to me. And I, in many cases, I was just surviving. But it takes as long as it takes. And it's your journey. Everybody is different. And you just can't ever, ever, ever give up. Anybody know who said that? Winston Churchill. So, as you can imagine, when Connor and Kyle were 4 and 14, they both struggled mightily with Dana passing away. And because of her prescription addiction to that junk, I lost my house, my business, we lost everything. We had to go live with a friend. 
and it just was there were days that I just wonder I don't even know how many get on with this thing but I kept thinking I gotta raise these two boys and I remember as we got as I slowly got back on my feet it took a long time many many nights I thought I didn't do anything to deserve this but you keep pushing forward and for those of you that are parents as well as spouses and people you love in your life that's what you do it for as well as yourself but Connor was having a real struggle and so he goes into the uh, fifth uh, the um, preschool and they say your son is all screwed up I said well you know his mom just died six months ago I know I know but he's messed up so they put him through all these tests and everything and and they bounce balls and find motor skills and I know they were trying to help but in the end they call they have him go wait in the lobby and they talk to me and he's gonna need all this special treatment and occupational therapy and all these different kinds of things and I say you know he's just doing the best he can after having Lewis lost his mom and his dad's doing the best he can and his older brother but Connor just wouldn't give up when I walked out to the car I got in the car and he goes is everything okay daddy and I burst into tears and I probably cried for a half hour and kept saying what's wrong I said it's, it's okay it's gonna be fine but it was devastating so I went ahead and held him back in first grade and did all these things a special education plan whatever it was called there's an acronym for that but I kept trying and then along the way he said well I want to play baseball and Connor I said you're having a tough time in school how are we gonna worry about sports so for those of you that have kids you know they start out with t-ball and then coach pitch and Connor would come to t-ball and you know again the ball doesn't move it just sits on the tee I, I'm not sure how difficult that is to hit that ball but he couldn't hit it <laughs> and he'd be swinging up here and all this kind of stuff and Connor and I'm the, trying to be the best parent having gone through all this stuff and I said lower the bat and he keeps and he finally gets down he lowers it he hits the actual tee the ball goes forward he goes dad I got a hit <laughs> And I remember thinking, I don't think that's how the game is played, but that's okay. And so, but he kept trying. And he never got, but he never played. He was always that, you know, the person that didn't get picked when he picked sides for baseball, football, basketball, whatever it was. But he kept trying. And we finally got to May 31st, 2005. He was about 10 years old. And he's playing baseball. And he's always in the dugout. It's bottom of seventh. Seven to six, the other team. And I think the coach is out of players. You know and so it's there's two guys on second and third or a guy in second and third and there's two out so I can see he's just like this like well who do I pick and he goes yeah Brooke Connor come on out so Connor comes out of the dugout just swinging the bat like he's Babe Ruth he's never even gotten a hit he's never gotten a bunt you know but he's like that and then he does something that was really odd hey dad I'm up and I go now what child ever talks to their parents in the stands you know I'm not supposed to be there but he gets up there and he's swinging away and it's ball one strike one ball two strike two full count the next pitch comes in and Connor just rips it down the left hand left baseline the third baseline in the left field goes past the third base guy the guy from third comes in the guy from second rounds third and comes in here comes the ball the guy the catcher the guy catches it they all crash on home plate and the ball pops out <laughs> so they win eight to seven and Connor is here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for leading that applause. Connor is standing out on second base. He goes, Dad, I got a hit. And he's like waving from second. But we go home that night, and he had struggled, as I mentioned, in school and everything else that he did in sports. And I sat him down on the couch. And even to this day, it's a long time ago, I still get choked up about it. But I said it was never about baseball Connor it was about the fact that you never gave up and you just never ever did his senior year he was a leadoff hitter for Bothell High School and he got a 3.5 and that's kind of a small picture but there's Connor at six foot two starting in school down in San Diego he's just finished his first year but I'm so yeah, thank you. <laughs> you guys are so sweet but I told him you don't have to have that attitude but I think it pays because, and then Marla and I were talking about this a bit as well. There are just so many things that we go through. This is life. When I get to do these commencement speeches, I talk about life, about that's the way it is. This is not fun. This is where you want to be. This is where we end up being sometimes, and we want to be back here. But this is where all the lessons are learned down here. You know, when we've all been rich and famous or whatever, and you got all these friends, you can't even keep up with them all because they're all calling you. Jeez, I was on TV about it. A month or so ago and I got all these calls from people I went to kindergarten with 
But, you know, it, it's just... <laughs> hey, Dave, how, do you, how can I get on Channel 5? Anyway, but so it's just, it's so important. So when I, when I wrap up, I'm going to make sure to remind you this embrace gratitude. I don't care what your journey is. You know, typically, this was fun about meeting Warren and Alan and a few people around here that I'm typically by far the oldest guy in the room, you know, and it's like, wow. So it's at least, at least nice to find a few peers, you know, that the, the, the first number's a six, you know, versus it wasn't that long ago, it was a three. But, but what is interesting, though, too, is you embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. And then I tell people, make room for gratitude. You got to get rid of the junk. And I noticed as I was driving in here, I generally try to get places early and I don't like to be stressed. And occasionally I'll go into you know, housing developments and, and you, you look at these three things that are by the houses, which I believe are called garages. And they're supposed to be for cars. And a lot of times they're, the doors are up and they're just floor to ceiling boxes. And then they have a little teeny thing where you can see they go like this to get to their stuff. You know? And you can see them and it's just like this narrow. And I always think it's just stuff. But we do that with our brains as well. And one of the reasons why we've got to get rid of stuff is you've got to make room, for this case, gratitude. And I talk about it all the time. When you go back out to those cars, a lot of cars out there, I think there's a tournament. Notice that the windshield is about two feet deep and about four or five feet wide on your car. And then notice the rearview mirror is about this big. That's about 200 to 1 or something like that. I would suggest there's a reason why that's that way. Mostly you want to go with what's in front of you. Learn a little bit from the past. Pay attention to those lessons. If you look in that thing and you see flashing blue lights, you have to pull over. <laughs> but mostly learn from that and move forward. And so I realized too when I've been fortunate enough to do these workshops, we do something that is sort of irritating. Is we drive over junk with our car, we pick it up, we put it in front of us and we drive over it again. It just cracks me up. And I'll say to somebody, and this, I'll get these questions, yeah, it's easy for you to say, you don't have an ex-husband like mine. He was such a knucklehead. <laughs> okay. When did you get divorced? 1988? <laughs> I, think, well, I, I think it's time to get over that by now. So it's just a matter of getting rid of those things. And that's one of the things with this first digit being a six. Again, I'm not as fond of, but... I will tell you, you get a lot smarter. And I think that you learn those lessons. And I've said many times, I've paid a lot of tuition. It just hasn't always gone to schools. And I think it was also interesting about the happiness piece. I hadn't heard this till about a year or so ago. John Lennon was five years old. And his mother said, I'm going to tell you the most important thing I'm ever going to tell you. He says, your whole goal in life is to be happy. And so John Lennon, okay, great. So, a few years later, he's in school. And they're going around the room, and the teacher says, what do you want to be when you grow up, John Lennon? And he goes, happy. <laughs> and the teacher looks at him, and she goes, uh, you don't understand the assignment. And John Lennon looks at the teacher and goes, you don't understand life. <laughs> so he had, it, he had it early on. So... When I think about making room for gratitude and cleaning out your brain, embracing gratitude, it takes as long as it takes, it's your journey. Never compare your inside to somebody else's outside. It's amazing. They got a bigger car, they have this. It just absolutely cracks me up because we all have these individual journeys, individual journeys. But you've got to get rid of the crud, you've got to get that stuff processed. I talked, I was doing a talk yesterday, and the gal said she figured out a long time ago the most important person to work on is herself. And it's so true because of that relationship you have with you. But I do think there are things that are methods to help you. And one of them is what I call, of course, a gratitude journal. Now, how many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? That's actually, thank you, that's actually a pretty good sized number. Because I had never heard of one. And so this buddy of mine, I got these, some of these friends, I don't understand if they're really true friends. But Bob says to me, well, you know, you're, really, you're still pretty messed up after Dana's death and all this other stuff that's happened to you. And I go, well, you know, my wife did die and my mom died and my dad. And he goes, yeah, you should be getting it together. But later he says, you need to get a gratitude journal. And I didn't know what it was, so I got one and I started writing in it and I noticed some difference. And then I made my own. I've got the, the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. And the way this works, I write in it every single day. It takes five minutes. 
And the structure of this, get to a blank page here, is it says day and date and daily number, which I'll get to in a second. There's two lines to write the current events or special events that are happening, so you don't have to have another journal or a diary. You can do it all here. I'm so grateful for on the left-hand side. Takes about two minutes to write that. The highlight of your day, and then on the right-hand side are your gratitude intentions. And the gratitude intentions are what you're grateful for that hasn't even happened yet. And for those of you that may know, your prefrontal cortex, where your subconscious mind is housed, does not necessarily know the difference between something that's happened or is going to happen. And when I can talk about it, I'm grateful for the larger and larger groups I keep getting to speak to, it keeps happening because you can program. And I've got a bunch of other examples, but that's one that comes to the top of my mind. So daily number. This is what the daily number is. It's a number from 1 to 10. 10 is the best day of your life. 1 is maybe one of the tougher days of your life. So I want you to grab the other 3 by 5 card, if you will. And on this one, this is just an individual exercise for you. I want you to just, whichever way you want to do it, put whatever your daily number is up in the right-hand corner. 1 through 10. You could do halves, I guess, but just however you're feeling. Now, this is sort of a private thing. This is not to be shared because I'm doing this differently today, but sometimes I have people raise hands and I say, if you're a 1 to 5, don't raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But put whatever that number is, okay? You can circle it, whatever. All right, now, I'm going to have you write two or three things just for you, yourself, and this card. Number one thing, what are you most grateful for if you can only pick one thing? Just one thing. I'm not going to, don't look at your neighbor, I'm not going to give any hints. Just write down what you're most grateful for. Okay, and for those of you that are speedy, the second thing is, what is the second thing you're most grateful for? All right, and lastly, what was the highlight of your day yesterday? What was the best thing that happened to you yesterday? Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do. Again, this is just you and your card. I want you to reread the three things that you wrote. Most grateful for something, the second thing you're most grateful for, and the highlight of your day yesterday, the best thing that happened yesterday. And now I want you to write a number down at the bottom and see if the number is any different after you've read those three things. Okay, so I gotta keep moving along because I only got about 10 minutes left. So, how many people's number went down? Anybody? Okay, how many people's number went up? Once again, thank you, gosh, three quarters of the room. A lot of times I have people till they're, till they're, a lot of times I have people call out their numbers, but this is quicker and I'm on short time today. But it's amazing because all that's doing is framing what you're grateful for. And when you write it, and I tell people when I do those high schools, they go, there's all some questions in the audience. Do you have an app? And I go, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I actually do have an app. You know, you just, you just press it, the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. I'm so grateful I had an opportunity to talk to Marlon today, have an interesting conversation about Montana and where I used to race hydroplanes or something like this. And you just press it and it just writes it. But it's not the same. It's not the same. You can go back and refer to what you wrote. It starts with a thought in your brain. It goes to your heart, to your arm, to your hand, to the pen, and you write it. I'm so grateful to Jamie Taylor and Randy Spitzer for inviting me here today. There's something about it. And they had a thing that came up recently that even the keyboard, where everybody has their, their lab, uh, laptops and tablets and so forth, it's not the same. It's just not the same. There's something about writing it. So I highly recommend that. So I'm going to cover, cover a couple more things. Gratitude in corporate America, a lot of people ask me, especially when I do chambers, well, what does gratitude have to do with my work life? Well, having managed a Nordstrom store and managing a lot of people, I've always felt that managing people, raising children, and some other things I've done in my life come back to one key element, and that's the example you set. I was the first guy in those Nordstrom stores. I later ran Lowe's Home Improvement stores. The first guy there, that was 5 o'clock in the morning. One of the last guys to leave. Our kids look at what we do versus what we say. And Connor and Kyle fortunately turned out really well, but I hope I set a really good example of how you can bounce back from a lot of adversity. But I've noticed that there was a survey recently that said 30% of the people that work are uninspired and are actually engaged in, excuse me, expired. 52% have a perpetual case of the Mondays. 
worst day of the week. And then of course my favorite, 18% are actively disengaged, roaming the halls of the work, spreading discontent. And I just thought, man, that is so sad. And I remember when I had the employees that I had and, and that setting that good example and the golden rule and knowing names, I really, by the way, pay attention to, so it's Mike, right? Yes. And what, I didn't see what you're Christine. Christine, that's right, because I'm going to talk to you afterwards and give you your money back after the, um, <laughs> after the, but when you, here's Alan back here who spells his name L-L-A-L-L-E-N, Woodard, not Woodward, you know, and Tracy and Marlon and, um, is it Greg? Yep, and of course Randy and Tracy. And, and I can, I, I'll sometimes go through and name every single person in the room. And it has nothing to do with impressing people. It has to do with the fact if you set your mind to something, you can do it. It's not that difficult. And people, you know, I just don't know if I have time to write in this little gratitude journal every day. And I go, well, it takes five minutes. And I'll write in it a couple days a week. And I go, so like you just brush your teeth a couple days a week? You know, <laughs> and... But people will look at mine and they'll kind of page through it and they'll go, wow, you write in this every day. And I go, yeah, were you like listening to the presentation? I mean, <laughs> that's what I kind of talk about. So, <laughs> But it is interesting, back to the corporate world, when I was managing Nordstrom, that was 15, 16 years ago and I since did Lowe's and so forth, the top three things people wanted in a job were being in on the know, help with personal problems, and appreciation and recognition. Now that's all changed 30 years later. Appreciation and recognition is still part of it, but people want goals, they want responsibilities, and does anybody want to guess what number one is now by the employees, what they want? Time. Flexibility. Benefit. Those are all good guesses. Number one, run right away. Respect. That's a good guess too. Uh, number one by far now is purpose. People want to know that it made a difference that they worked there. And you see it happen all the time, people leaving huge jobs and, and um, going away for something that has more purpose. And so, yes, Carrie? You know that I got Carrie? Yeah, yeah I, I can't see it from there, I got contact. No, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Would you say that um, the, the purpose would also be that it's the work that they do is fulfilling? Absolutely, absolutely, yep. That's good. Yep, you're absolutely correct. So, in about, I'm going to wrap up in about five minutes and so I'm going to do a book drawing later but I do like to mention to people I love referrals, I have some flyers in the back, I do sell my books and journals and I also do life coaching and anybody that's interested in a life coach or wanting to write a book or be a speaker or any of those kinds of things I get a lot of clients that want to come up and talk to me about it. that's something they always want to do so if you're interested stop by and say hi I also have a little sign up, I send out a two minute gratitude video every Monday morning and if you're interested in that there's a little place you can sign up it's just two minutes kind of a thing of the sort of the way to start your Monday off so last thing sharing gratitude I always hesitate to use this example but have many people here ever been involved with multi-level marketing or network marketing anybody show of hands so if you I've been involved in on and off and things the reason it's just it's I just love how enthusiastic these people are. It just They're so excited about it. And, and I cannot fault that. You know, we were having coffee and I get a latte and I get the thing at Starbucks and I go to the bathroom and come back, there's all these pill bottles here. You know, I go, what are all those? Well, that's what you're going to take. You know, and it's fine. So, but, but it's because people want to share something. And when you share something, it makes it so much more fulfilling. It just does. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like you to... First of all, let me ask this question. How many people here have looked at their smartphone since I've been talking? Okay, one, two, three, four. Four honest people in the room. Thank you. So, so all, I can always tell the honest ones. And, and I'll look at the gal here and say, well, you're boring me. I'm doing some emails. So take, take your... No, I'm not kidding. You were just easy target. So take your smartphones out, if you will. And here's what we're going to do. If you don't have a smartphone, don't have it, it's okay. This is called the four T's. I'm going to give you 60 seconds for this to have you text... Tweet, telephone, or tell somebody, it can be husband and wife, how grateful you are to have them in your life. 60 seconds, go. <laughs> you two are like, you're worth the price of admission. I gotta start hanging out with the kids. <laughs>
About 20 seconds. Okay, and stop. And of course, you can do that more later if you want. Um, I noticed at the high schools, they've knocked out about six texts yeah. in like 30 and 60 seconds. I've never seen fingers move so fast. Gosh. But it is, it is funny, though, because some of the reactions I get, I was doing a thing at a performing arts center, and there was somebody right over where John is. And I could hear her. She, most people are texting. But this gal was using her phone and she goes, you know, hi honey, yes, I just want to let you know how much I love you and I'm so grateful for you. No, I really am really grateful for you. I don't know, some speaker just told me to call you and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a couple others that they, they showed me the text. They said, I was using my phone, but I want to show you what she said. And he, she shows me and he says, are you sure you sent this to the right person? <laughs> and then I say, I forget there was another one that was, um, oh yeah, I remember what it was. She goes, I'm grateful for you too. What do you want? <laughs> so the point of that is, as you can imagine, is Remind yourself to tell you how grateful you are to yourself and the things. I'd love to see what are on those cards. I don't talk about this till later, but mine is typically health and my son's and having a roof over my head and just a lot of things we take for granted. And, and when you get a gratitude journal or you get to text to somebody how grateful you are, it's really amazing. We probably don't do that enough, I'm pretty certain. But this sharing gratitude thing is so important. I remember years ago, very one of these I always depend on the audience I'm talking to you, but I never did drugs, I never smoked dope or did coke, I never understood it. And then the pills killed my wife and booze and pills killed a lot of my friends. But I was always an adrenaline junkie. So I did all the bungee jumping and all this kind of crazy stuff and I learned how to fly and, and that was just really the thrill for me. So many years ago I get these same fraternity brothers and I make an appointment for skydiving. And so it's over in Issaquah and so it's that Saturday and so the Monday before the Saturdays for eight of us. Like three of them call me, uh, can't make it on Saturday. And uh, okay, no problem. Then on Wednesday I get two more calls. Hey Dave, <coughs> getting a sore throat. <laughs> and so on Saturday, I walk up to the counter like all proud. Hi, David Brooke, a reservations at 10 o'clock, party of eight. And he goes, uh, he looks around, and he goes, where are all your friends? And I go, I don't have any. <laughs> and I went by myself, all by myself. And there's a picture that shows me jumping out of the airplane. I'm all like scared and everything. But that's the only thing I have. I have that picture. But I didn't get to share that with anybody. So we, wasn't it cool when you did this or that or so forth? So I encourage you, whatever your coping mechanism is, because we all need them. Concentrate on having a healthy one. Get away from these nasty, deadly ones. And there's pills and booze, and it's just ridiculous, as I said. But gratitude, embracing gratitude and a gratitude journal is something that can change and transform your life. And I feel it saved my life. I really don't think I'd be here without it. And how it, I learned how to embrace that and see my life and frame it and focus it around gratitude. And it can change and save yours, too. Thanks a lot. Thanks, David. I'm grateful that you came today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do like to always do a drawing, and this would be a good time to do that drawing. David's graciously going to give away one of the journals.